Because in any case, the biggest expansion right now of the commodities that are being grown, in the green revolution, it was rice and wheat and corn. Today, it is GMO corn and GMO soya. Is it being eaten by people? 90% goes for biofuel and animal feed. 90%. Only 10% is being used for feeding, which is why we have a hunger emergency. One billion people without food. And actually, the disease epidemic and hunger are two sides of the same coin of a malfunctioning food system that isn't designed to feed people. It's designed to maximize profits and maximize carelessness. If you see the advertisements, I remember we didn't have Roundup in India. It's still not approved. Monsanto is spreading it illegally. But in Bangalore, I saw a wall painting. And it had a woman's hands tied up in greens. And it said, liberate yourself. Use Roundup. That working with plants is slavery. And the reason you have so much industrial food is I remember you used to have a lovely advertising uh, um, image of Betty Crocker. Betty Crocker was to liberate us from our kitchens. And I, now I'm sometimes taken to, to new buildings, especially where super rich finance people are living now. And the buildings have no kitchens. They have a TV and a microwave next to it. So you're making all this money, a million a month, and eating junk. We need new indicators of true well-being. I work with the government of Bhutan, and in Bhutan, they said we won't measure GDP, we'll measure happiness. So I help them with the transition to organic. And they have created a happiness index. I think the food and sustainable agriculture, ecological community should join hands to make a well-being index for all life on earth and all human beings. And what should be excluded? What should be banned? 5G. <laughs> GMOs, toxic chemicals. All of that doesn't have a place at all. So, of course, we can grow more food without destroying the planet. In fact, we regenerate the planet in growing real food. And the reason is quite simply because we are a continuum with the earth. You're not separate. And all beings are a continuum. We created these very crazy hierarchies. You know, men superior to women, white superior to blacks, rich superior to poor, superior races. We declared nature as dead. We pl declared plants as vegetative. Now, the interesting thing is the roots of vegetable is, in Latin, is full of life. To be a vegetable is to be full of life. But we've changed the meaning. To vegetate means to be dead. In the hospital, so-and-so is on life support. They've turned into a vegetable. I'm, I'm writing a new dictionary. <laughs> I'm writing a new dictionary of how every term was turned on its head to allow this 1% economy and the poison economy to explode. Crop life is the name of the lobby group of the pesticide industry. Crop life? Sanitary and phytosanitary measures are the name for shutting down all healthy and safe food. Women in England could not bring cakes to hospitals on Sundays. It was considered dangerous. Industrial food in packages was considered healthy and safe. In India, they tried to shut down all our edible oils, and we did the Sarso Satyagraha. I mentioned Gandhi's word for the force of truth, for fighting unjust, brute law, 
which is also practiced by Thoreau, who doesn't come from very far from here. His Walden Pond is right here. And when he was being forced to pay the poll tax, he said, I will not pay, because my paying the poll tax means I'm supporting slavery. And he refused. He went to jail for a day. Gandhi practiced Satyagraha throughout his life, first against apartheid in South Africa. He said, we are one humanity. We can't be divided by race. Against the compulsory planting of indigo, against the salt tax. When I started Navdanya, I started the seed Satyagraha. I said, no matter what law you bring, our duty to the earth is to save our seeds. Our duty to future generations is to hand over seeds in the purity, integrity, beauty, diversity in which we receive them. Therefore, we will not obey your laws that come in the way of this higher duty to the earth and our fellow humanity. We've done the Sarsa Satyagraha where they tried to ban our local oils. They tried to ban Gandhi's cold press mill two years ago. And I was called and I did a Satyagraha. And what was the criteria for shutting down Gandhi's heritage mill? Because it didn't have a lab and two chemists. Now, when something's hazardous, you want to measure the hazards. But when something's pure and you're cooking it yourself, that direct relationship is the verification. So I'm now working, like I'm requesting you to join a movement on doing a new index of well-being in the continuum of life on Earth. I'm working on a new system of safety and well quality in food with the women's movements of India. We are creating local groups because our local food is being shut down under the pseudo hygiene measures. If it's not packaged, it can't be brought. Yeah, we want to give to each other open without the plastic, without the aluminium, with a lot of love to each other and a guarantee that I have grown this with love and quality and those who are eating it. I don't like the word consumer because the word consumption in the Middle Ages was the word for TB. You died of consumption and we are dying of consumption and we are killing the planet of our consumption. We are killing the planet of consumption and we are killing, killing the planet of convenience. 5G, fertilizers, pesticides. When I ask people, I said, why are you so addicted to constantly having your phone? I mean, you see how we are like zombies? We're sitting next to each other and like that. We've forgotten community. We've forgotten communion. We've forgotten neighborliness. We've forgotten family. We've forgotten earth family. So what I've been trying to do over the last five decades is cultivate earth democracy. That the ultimate democracy is the democracy of being alive and sharing this life with other life and being aware of the vibrance and the cooperation that it calls for. And I can see that no matter what it has been, it could be a river's life, it could be a forest life, it could be the life of our farms and our soil, it could be the seed, it could be our women's groups making the most delicious food. It is at the end of it about the democracy of life and the celebration of diversity as equality. We've been made to believe that uniformity is equality, but uniformity creates hierarchies. The measure of whiteness creates the inferiority of the black. The measure of maleness and patriarchy creates the domination over women. The measure of anthropocentrism creates the domination over the natural world. It's those dominations that we need to transcend now. And, and for me, you know, there's a new book we've, we've done. It's called Annam in India. And there's a Acres uh, publications that works on sustainable agriculture. They've just brought this out in, uh, in the US. It's called Food Farming and Health. And it's the consolidation of all our work that interfaces our work on organic farming, biodiversity, soil, and health. And there are Ayurvedic doctors who've written chapters here. 
There are public health specialists who've contributed. So do look for it. And this book called Biodiversity, Agroecology and Regenerative Organic Agriculture will also be published this year by them. It's our 30 years of learning of how we can address every problem we face through protecting biodiversity, practicing agroecology, and promoting regenerative agriculture, whether it be the problem of the disappearance of species, whether it be the problem of the disappearance of water, the degradation of our soil, the destabilization of climate systems, the disease epidemic, the hunger and malnutrition, or the destruction of our farming families. 31 years of a lot of labor of love in there. But I want to conclude by the final connection between the planet and our health. The world is biodiversity, but we often forget that we are biodiversity. We are 90% non-human. Only 10% of us is human. And in our gut are the gut bacteria, 100,000 times more microbes in our gut than on people on the planet. And a specialist on the, uh, on the mind-gut relationship says, for decades the mechanistic militaristic disease model set the agenda for medical research. As long as you could fix the affected mechanical part, we thought the problem would be solved. There was no need to understand its ultimate cause. We were just beginning to realize that the gut, the microbes living in it, the gut microbiota, the microbiome, constitute one of the major components of these regulatory systems and the signaling molecules that they produce from their vast number of genes. The reason you need as much diversity in your food, you have to first grow it and eat it, is because the gut is an amazing, intelligence system, it's actually being called the second brain, the enteronervous system. There's more neurological activity going on in the gut than in the brain. And the fact that so many neurological disorders are growing because of the food we eat is because of the connection to the gut. Specific molecules and phytochemicals found in herbs and spices activate specific taste receptors and trigger particular metabolic processes. Sweet receptors stimulate the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream and release the insulin from the pancreas when they sense glucose. And just because they industrialize sugar, let's not forget there's been lots of natural sugar. We make organic gur. The sugar cane was domesticated in India, in the Ganges Basin. It's a lie that Columbus found it somewhere in the Pacific Islands. It's been used from the ancient texts. You can go back to the Jain test and the Buddhist test. And there's a lovely Jain temple where it's supposed to have been domesticated, where the prasad they give, prasad is the sacred food, a little bit of sugarcane juice. And we make gur, natural sugar, and shakar, and bura, and hundreds of ways of artisanal processing. And these are complex sugars. They don't contribute to diabetes. Ayurveda actually recommends them as part of a diabetic diet. We are just starting to figure out again because it's not that systems like Ayurveda, which is the science of life, did not know. But we've forgotten. I mean, me mechanistic thought and industrial farming has been nothing but a forgetting how life works. And celebrating killing as a substitution for living. We need to get rid of that thinking. Because it is, it's given us a century of ecocide and genocide. The ecocide has exploded in the last 30 years as the industrial model has globalized. The genocide, which was so directly the objective of the original use of the chemicals in farming, which became chemicals of farming, the chemicals that were evolved, has again become a genocide. Whether it be the genocide of the farmers, the 310,000 farmers who committed suicide in India, the 200,000 farmers annually who die of pesticide poisoning. This is data according to the UN Rapporteur on food. Or the sicknesses that are becoming the biggest killer, the chronic diseases. That This is a genocide. 
It's nothing less than a genocide. And we have to stop both the ecocide and the genocide. And the ecocide and genocide will stop when we turn our backs to the mindset and the tools and the technologies that destroy life, to the intelligence and our capacities and our potential to regenerate life, protect life, and create life in abundance. We need to once again become conscious that food is living and eating is not a mechanical act, but the most significant act for maintaining healthy lives and the life of the planet. Eating is a conversation between the soil, the plants, the cells in our gut, cells in our food, and between our gut and our brain. Eating is an intelligent act at the deepest cellular and microbial level, and I would say spiritual level too. Eating is an intelligent act. The cellular communication is the basis of health and well-being. It is also the root of disease. Poison food creates disease. We need, might be ignorant about the links between food and health, but our cells know. We can be fooled with fake labels, but we can't cheat our gut microbiome. And because food carries with it the memory of the biodiversity in soil and the plants, how food is grown is a major determinant of health. Through the ecological science of agroecology and Ayurveda, our minds could catch up with the intelligence of the earth, our bodies, its doshas, its cells, its microbes, which are trying to alert us to the dangers in our food and environment through the disease epidemic. It's time to regenerate. Thank you.